All right, so I think we're going to get started. Um, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, it, I know it's the middle of the day, and it might not be, especially for the students. Thanks for taking some time out of your class schedule to come. Me, I'm a second, third year medical student. I'm Isaac Vingen. Um, and I am proud to say that I am the grandson of Aww. this lovely woman right here. <laughs> so this is my bubby, uh, and she's just here to do a little story time and tell the stories that she's been telling me since the day I was born. The, the stories that are tragic, but the ones that I love to hear and the ones that need to be heard. And I am just so grateful that not only is she able to be here, but she's willing to be here and she's happy to be here. And her mother, some of the stories, she'll tell you some of the stories she doesn't remember herself, but they're like her own memories because her mother has been telling them to her since they happened because she knew she needed to remember them and she tells them to me because she knows I need to remember them. And she tells them to all of you because the same reasons. So I think no further introductions are needed. Bubby, Jeannie, Parnas, Wexler. I said to my grandson, how am I going to start this? What are going to be the first words I'm going to say? Because it's, I'm not a speaker. I'm just a storyteller, like you said. So if I mispronounce or whatever, just forgive me. But thank you very much for coming, and thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to have the pleasure to tell this story for all you beautiful people and future doctors who will help a lot of people, I am sure. And of course, <laughs> my Isaac. So our story is very different than the stories you, the world knows about the Holocaust, the concentration camps, all the horrors that it went through. I am happy and guilty to say that our story, as horrible as it was, had a happy ending. And so the very few stories of the Holocaust that um, have a happy ending. Ours did. So I'm going to go back to our little hometown where we lived in the Ukraine and Poland at that time. And I was the youngest of this beautiful family. See over there the first one? And that's my oldest brother. And this one, the Sally, because of her, I am here. And because of her, we survived. But she paid a lot for it. So back into our little hometown, my father was a tailor. We were very poor. My parents were actors Jewish, on the Jewish stage before the war. And very well liked and respected in our town. And uh, we lived in a, in a one room. Uh, the house was two rooms that belonged to my grandparents, my mother's. And they gave one room to my mother and the other to the other sister. My mother had all of her children. She gave birth in her life to 10 children, but she raised seven. And I was the ninth. Um, so, we all lived in that one room. That, that was in 1939. And by 1939, the things were already happening. Just that nobody on our side knew about it. In 1941, Hitler decided to split Poland and to take Stalin, which was the head of Russia at the time, in as a partner. And we fell into the part where the Russians were. 
for us, it was a very big luck because what do the communists do? You all know about communism, socialism, whatever. I'm not a politician, but I know what they did. They come in, they confiscate all the wealth from all the wealthy people, send them to Siberia, and all their wealth becomes government. The middle class who had a small business was also confiscated. They had a little house, they, they, they put more people into their house, or they took it away. Because we were a poor family, and because we had nothing to take from us, they took my father's little shop, not only his, but that's what they did. If you had uh, made the shoes, you're a shoemaker, they took your business away and they put everybody in the factory to make shoes for the Russian government. And the same with tailoring and everything else. So, but for us, because we were a very poor family, not just us, anybody that was like us, whether you were Jewish or, or Ukraine or whatever, they helped you with having a better home situation. So with us, they gave us a small house that had two rooms and a sink and running water. To us, it was a palace. And they got to know my parents and they reopened the Jewish theater because in 1938 they closed everything. And, so, and by then my oldest sister, Sally, the one that was talking to you about it because of how I'm here, had a gorgeous voice and as you see she was very beautiful. And now, by now, they came in, she was 13, now two years later she's 15, beautiful. And she also played theater. And I forgot to tell you that in the same hometown lived a very handsome dude, really handsome. But he was not from the kind of family that we were. There was cursing, there was, you know, my parents did not want him, thank God. And that's why I'm here. And um, he fell in love with her. He always came around the house. He always followed wherever she went, and she was afraid. You know, in those days, a 15-year-old girl doesn't go with a boy. And time goes on. Now it's 1941. My oldest brother was born with a club foot. So he wore a special shoe, and he was a very bright boy. And this young man, whose name was Azriel, always protected my brother because the young people in the community knew that the, uh, the, the by the way if there are anybody here with the nationalities that i am mentioning i love you just the way you are it's not against you it's so please forgive me and um so he always protected my brother and of course he came because he wanted to see her one day, the, boy, the Ukrainian boys were waiting for the Nazis to come because in their mind, because they took the wealth away from them also, those that had. So everybody in, in the town was quite um, happy to hear that the Nazis, that the Germans are coming. Didn't know the word Nazis then. He, um, they uh, caught my brother. And they beat him up, and they said, the Nazis are coming tomorrow, which was June 22nd, but this was June 20th. And you'll be the first one we're going to kill. So he ran home. I'm telling it to you, those that are going to buy the books, it may be written a little bit different. I am just repeating what my mother kept telling us over again. Because when the war is over, the little ones will go home and tell all our uncles and cousins the stories. Where was I? Okay, so um, my mother said, you know, take your bicycle and a couple of things and go to over the old Russian border, which was like 14 kilometers from us, 
and you'll sleep over, and tomorrow you'll come back. They're not going to stay here. Why? Because in 1914, that's what happened. The Germans came, and they passed by all these small towns, and they kept going towards Russia, east, and uh, they didn't touch anybody. A lot of the Jewish people, who things were taken away from them, when they heard that the Germans are coming, they were dancing in the streets. I found out after the war from somebody that survived. Because in their mind, the, Germ they, the Germans will come back, they'll take everything back from the Russians and give it back to them. So it was like a, yeah. My brother takes his bike, he gets out. I'm sorry I'm taking so much time to explain this without this, there is, I'm not here. <laughs> and uh, he takes his bike and he starts riding into the middle of the town and he meets my sister Sally. Where are you going? And he tells her, she says, you can't go by yourself. She was used to taking care of him with his foot. Everybody's always Moshe. Moshe was God. And um, and you will see at the end what God does with his foot. She says, you can't go by yourself. I have to go with you. And uh, we'll come back together. Blah, blah, blah. Okay. He takes it on his, um, whatever you call the front of the bicycle. And they want to start moving. And this handsome dude comes along. He says, hey, what's going on? Where are you going? What are you doing? And they tell him. And he says, you can't go by yourself. You, a beautiful young girl, you know what the soldiers are going to do? Because they were already coming from all over, going east. And you, with your foot, who's going to, you can't, if you really, he has to go. If you really want to go, I'm coming with you. All on one bicycle? <laughs> so he went away. He came back with two bicycles. And as they start moving, my sister Clara, who just passed away in September, is 11, and she comes along, and it looked like they're going on a vacation, on a picnic. She also wants to go. And my sister Sally says, go home and tell mom and dad that I went with them and for the night, and I'll be back when they come back. She comes home and tells them the story. And if I can use those words, all hell broke loose. My father, he was unbelievable. How did, he didn't want that boy terribly. He did not want him. He wanted her to marry at somebody like himself, a doctor. <laughs> and um, so they started, uh, I remember as a little girl, I swear to you, I remember my father screaming, and I think to myself, I never heard him scream. He was such a quiet, s sensitive, quiet person. And my father's mother is sitting there, excuse me, and she says to my mother, her name was Esther, those that know Yiddish. Esther, kid, you have to go and take her back. You, those that will buy a book will come across, across that name. And who knows what the soldiers are going to do to her? Excuse me. My mother, I forgot to tell you that the Friday before, which was just a few days, my father went to shul. And Friday night, he brought back a guest for, for Shabbos, for Friday night. And when everything was over, and he was a runaway from the other side, from where Hitler was. And when everybody left the table, and I was sitting on her lap, she said to him, I forgot his name, I used to remember, what exactly is this Hitler doing that is so gefällig, that is so terrible? And he says, what he does, the says that kind sits of the, you see your child is sitting on your lap. The first thing he does when, he, when they come in is separate the children from the parents. And with that in mind, she was afraid she's going to lose 
her and my oldest brother, she was okay because a boy. But the girl, she has to, we have to go and bring her back. Now what about the little ones? I was not quite four, my sister not quite six, my brother not quite eight, and then 11 and 30, which makes five, and two were gone. What should she do? She ran to the Russians and asked for help, and they said, for the mother of Sally, we will do whatever we can. And she tells him she wants to go and bring her back. Do we have a carriage? Do you have an airplane? To us, a carriage and horses, it wasn't something that poor people had. It's so he picks up his head and he sees a, um, a carriage with a driver on it. It looks just like this, which somebody made for us when we gave the books out. And because he was from there, and he remembered exactly what it looked like. You can look at it later. And the Russian guy calls him over. And by the way, the, the, the Russian leaders that were in our hometown were announcing that we are leaving, because the Nazis are coming tomorrow. Whoever wants to go, we will help you provide transportation. Who wanted to go? Nobody wanted to go. Where am I going to go? To, to Russia, to the pogroms? Hitler came in the 14. They didn't do anything. Well, we'll stay. We're fine. They, they were happy that they're coming because now the Germans will take and give them back. He sees the guy, calls him over. He asks for his passport. He tells him, go and do whatever this lady wants. And when you come back, I'll give you the passport and some other secret words. My mother comes home with him and she comes in and she tells my father that that's what I brought a wagon and we are going to just till they find them and then come back. And my father, no way, he's not going. And, and my aunt was there and my mother's brother who said, ah, come to me in the basement, we'll hang out, we'll wait a few days, they'll be gone. And my mother knows she has to go and find Sally and bring her back. So my aunts, I remember being dressed by them, and they threw together a few things, like little blankets and pillows with feathers and um, whatever food there was in the house. Anyway, the wagon's leaving. My father's not going. But as we start, moving the carriage, he walks near the carriage, and there he comes. And as we are driving away, there was a car, my, my father's sister's son ran after the carriage, and he, he wants to go, he wants to go, but we're coming back tomorrow, ah, take him, he fell, my father fell, sorry, he took. also survived because of it. Okay, now we are, following a caravan of people that are going, wherever they go, we go. There's only one way, and that's to rush to east. And there is a lot of uh, military, the Russian military, they're all leaving, and some people hooked in from other neighborhood uh, towns or whatever, and we're amongst them looking for Sally. And my mother looks through the carriages and people, and we go further and further, nothing. Until very early in the morning, it was difficult to see, but we wanted to get ahead. And we passed by a chicken farm. And on the chicken farm, my, there are people with their souls towards us. And, and it was low because the chicken coops are low and and my mother says, wait, wait, let me go back when they passed it. Everybody's uh, souls were st straight and there was one going this way. That's Moish's foot because of his we stopped and we reunited 
and it was so bittersweet. Um, crying and laughing, and what are you doing here to Azrael? My father was very, very angry because in his mind she ran away with him, but he really went to help her. And the guy ran away, the driver, and Isley was the only, Azrael was the only one that could handle the horses. My brother, who was with us, was 11. He knew a little bit because my uncle dealt with horses, but not enough to want to take this. Sorry. <laughs> and he starts moving the carriage to go back home. When all of a sudden we hear planes and they come like you see, you see a lot of birds together like with the wings of, that's what we see. And, and we hear and see them throwing bombs. And I was scared, I was crying. My oldest brother said, Ginyale, they are, they are throwing, I forgot what he said, they're throwing, uh, they're throwing suitcases with, with something, candies or toys in it, was, you know, to just keep me. So could we go home? Can we turn around and go back home? continued following all these people. So the, my whole story is about three and a half months being in this horse and buggy and running away. So I'm going to tell you some stories that happened that are in the book and some are not in the book. Because when they were interviewing for the book, in my brother's mind, I was still the little one. Ginyale. So if I wanted to say, something, what do you remember? What do you, you know, like, I remembered more than they did. But anyway, so the first bombing was right there. We turned around and started moving, and these planes came, and they bombed and bombed and bombed. People were trying to run away, including us. And the death and the devastation around us was indescribable. The people in the carriages next to us was a family with a little girl that I played with like from one carriage to the other. They were all dead. All of them were dead. She lost his, her head. The scapula, the head was rolling. And I was little. I, I saw it. And my mother closed my eyes. And my sister said, I'm sorry that we shouldn't see all that. And the, this was on this side. On this side was, was a wagon that was all smashed up. A horse with his feet up, all four, his stomach is open. A man next to him, how do you say in English, the tzitzis, the, um, yeah, this. And I, as a kid, didn't know exactly what it was, but he was laying there with, it's, it's like a white, um, shirt without sleeves or however to explain and it has these white strings on the side and his stomach is open and his and a little boy laying right next to him that a little bit further was a man with, that I remember I'm not telling you what somebody told me I saw it a man without this part of the legs and a little boy sitting like this, laying with his head on, on the thigh of the father, also dead. I mean, there was so much. It's just I, as a kid, saw that, and it just stayed. Because people say, you remember? How can you not remember this? It is just like. Our carriage, with all this devastation around us, was not touched, 
not one, not a nail on anybody. So the guilt is, is there. <laughs> and that's what, so that, that was one miracle. And we went on. So we were three and a half months. Another story that I remember very well is being on the road. And the food was, you know, everybody got what they could, like uh, Azrael. And my father doesn't want him. He brings the food. He did the uh, more. He, um, OK. So it's coming to the evening. We need some place to sleep, to bed down the kids, or whatever. So we see this uh, um, abandoned hut. And we, he pulls over there, and we all go inside. It's quiet. And in the, in, uh, towards early in the morning, the, it was dark outside still, I think. And we hear these planes. And we hear the bombs. And I don't know how long it took. It quieted down. The ceiling came off. Some walls were broken. That's how close we were to the bombs. He, um, so when it quieted down in the morning, my brother Izzy, he was 13 at the time, came into the hut and took my mother by her hand. And he said, come. He had gone out first to check it out and then came back. Took her hand and shows her a bomb that didn't go off. Another bomb that didn't go Seven bombs around our hut that didn't go off. And you'll read it in the book. My mother said one was meant for each of my children, and she calls out the names. Was it a miracle or not? I don't know. It's like <sighs> one time we came to a, um, uh, in the evening, we wanted to ask a farmer if he would let us into the stable and to sleep over. And, this Azrael goes over and asks, and asks, whatever, he come, can we sleep over in the barn? He says, what? Jede, you know, means Jew. You, got, you know, we should leave. Okay. He went back to the carriage, and we started leaving. And as we are going far enough away, but we can still see, a plane came and bombed his so I don't know, was he a, a devil or an angel, this guy? <laughs> um, one time we passed, I mean, I can't tell you um, what my mother did. It was just unbelievable how she, um, everything for the kids and everything to be together. And, and it wouldn't be for her brains and, and Azriel's strength. It, wouldn't have happened. But um, so this one time, I re this is like my story, two stories I have in mind. We passed by an orchard where cherries were growing, and we hear planes. And so my brother in law takes the horses and he goes into that orchard, and there was, um, what do you call it, where the soldiers shoot from there? Trenches, I feel, and, and he parks the, car, the wagon, but I feel somebody holding my hands and with my face to the earth putting me down. And the same to my sister. Everybody went down except for my mother because she wanted the children to have something to eat in their mouths. I remember my mother going like this with a dress and picking cherries, and the bombs are flying, and she brings it over and gives it to us to eat. This is one story that was mine that I remember more than. Whenever we stopped and there was bombing, 
the older child grabbed the smaller one and ran wherever, ran for cover. Doesn't mean that the bomb can't get you there, but I guess it's the instinct of the human. So this particular time, we started to bed down and tie the horses, which we always did, and, um, and we hear planes come. Planes means bombing. So everybody grabbed the child and ran in different directions. My oldest brother grabbed me under this arm and he ran with me and it's when I became aware that he's limping because there's a little girl at home I didn't realize. He runs in with me into a barn where there are cows. He lays me down next to him and he's laying here and the cow has a tail. And she's washing my face with a, and I was four years old or less. I was very scared. I started crying. He picked me up and he put me on his chest and through the night I lay there and I often feel I'm still there. His warmth, his protection was something that you can't explain. You can't, I don't have the words, maybe you guys do, but it was just, just remarkable. In the early morning, um, we get up, it's quiet, they stop bombing, and he picks me up and he carries me, and from every corner of that field, I mean, first of all, what we saw was um, people lying dead all over the place and the, the uh, um, feathers were flying like, like snow. It was terrible. But from every, and from every corner, wherever there were walking people, was a member of my family, my mother and father, and from every corner came a different member with a child in their hands, and we all survived. So, it's a little bit difficult for me the older I get. I'm not bragging. We were lucky. So I'm gonna tell you how my, a, a very important thing that happened in, in my mother's, mother's life. Um, her name was Hannah, and we were from the working class, and I don't know how it was here, but in Europe, the, the poor people, the working class had their own shul, which we were, and the shul was running down. So my grandmother undertook to raise money for the shul to fix it. And it took time and she did it. Hired the people, they were also not charging, I remember them saying, they made it possible for it to happen. Um, and I don't know how to say it in English, a Christ Rabina. You know what it means, right? So um, he was from Hushatan. So he, they called him the Hoshaten Rebbe. I have his picture in my kitchen and the, and the blessing. And so he wanted to meet my grandmother and she came to the shul and he said he wants to give her, you know, a prestigious place in shul. And she said, in Yiddish of course, uh, I don't want anything, I just, if you can give me a blessing. And this rabbi looked at her, and he gave her a blessing. I have to say it in Yiddish first. Anybody understand Yiddish? No? Um, so I'll say it in English. I don't know if it's the exact interpretation, but it is as close as I can read. I am blessing you. I am giving you the blessing that you your children and your children's children's children should find favor in God's eyes and in people's eyes. And every time that 
we were saved. My mother used to say, "Oi, this is the mums. That's the blessing that is that saved us." And um, uh, what else happened on the road? That was oh, all through the time. My father is very not nice to us, well. and the poor Sally was so you know she. Because of my father's attitude, she kind of detached from the family and catered to him because he's alone, doesn't have anybody. And he said to her, you're my mother, you're my father, I left my, my family for you. And so she felt that she needs to be on his side. But he did everything for us. And one time my father uh, oh, and my mother, many, many times. You see the children are dying of hunger? Look what you did. It is because of you that everybody is suffering. And it was just so unpleasant. And so, okay, so this happened through the five years because after we got done with the traveling, we were in Russia, I'll get to it. So two more things. Once we were on a bridge with a lot of people on it. The Dnieper, anybody? So we had to cross that. And there were a lot of people on it, but very slow moving. And um, when we came a little bit closer, we started hearing planes. And as we got closer to get off, the planes came and they bombed the bridge. The bridge broke, everybody fell in, those that fell in drowned. And, um, and the bridge was kind of hanging and then more planes came and smashed it got off. One time we also had with my brother-in-law uh, about him. He, um, again, we came where we had to cross uh, water. And uh, we waited in the line and the, the um, carriages in front of us fell over and fell into the water and you saw people drowning and it was very scary. But we had to do it and so he we are all in the carriage and he starts driving I mean going into the water and as we came kind of more or less in the middle the carriage jerked and the horse stopped with his hoofs whatever up and he couldn't go any further and we're all sitting, and you see people are drowning on both sides. I remember the carriage, the fear of the carriage moving. And so this Azrael jumped inside the water. He went down, and he came up saying that the wheel is stuck between two rocks. And my mother, of course, please do see what you can do to, to save my children. And he went back. 18 years old, and with his shoulder, raised up the carriage with all the people on it, enough for the wheel to come out. And, um, and he came up, and he got in the carriage, and he saved us. There is just no two ways about it. He saved us. So 20 years later, no, 20 years ago, we, the book came out, and my kids organized a second Seder to hand the books out. So we rented a shul, and we ordered a kosher um, uh, cook, whatever you call it. And we had, at that time, 86 people. So in the back of the book, there, because it's a second printing, there is a picture of all of us. And now these little kids, 
are kids themselves, parents themselves, you know, and what they had organized is a center platform and all the grandchildren of my parents were asking the four questions, you know, in the Jewish stand. So um, each question they turned around because we were all sitting like four tables like this. And it was just something. And they asked the questions to each, each one. OK, so back to the road. I don't know if I'm leaving any stories out from the road, uh, eventually. Oh, uh, no. No, I think I'm good. Yeah. Yeah. Eventually, we got deeper into Russia. Oh, one thing I have to tell you. Um, my sister and I were very close, close in age and close. We did everything together. We were not allowed to walk away from the carriage. If we had to go uh, relieve ourselves, we'd hold hands and go behind the bush, but never away from the carriage. This one particular time, we were waiting to get on a train. They decided that they're going to leave the carriage and we're going to get on a train and just go with everybody. My father was very much against it because he said that it's an easier target for those in the plane because they will see a big train and want to get rid of it sooner than the sooner, whatever. So my sister Tobalu, which by the way, this is hers. The earrings are hers. We knew her. Um, she was a really an ashoma. Uh, she died in September, so it's so close. It is. And she said, Ginyale, which was my Jewish endearing name, like you call somebody Susie instead of Susan, uh, come with me, I want a drink of water. And she always had an issue, she needed water, even as an adult. And I remember feeling, that, although then I didn't know that it was guilt, that I said no. I knew I was afraid, wasn't allowed to walk away from the carriage. And she walked away, and we have to go on the train. And we start packing, looking, and they see that she's missing. How much time do I have? And um, so my, everybody said, Kim, let's go without her. My mother said, no way. Nobody's going. We're not going without her. This is real. Jumped on the horse. How far can she go? She's a little girl. And took the horse and went around to look for her and found her just as the woman brought her out a cup of water. And she never got the water, but he grabbed her. And by the time he came back, we missed the train. So again on the wagon, and a few hours later, we passed by the same train that was bombed. And there was nobody. So we were saved again, right? Eventually, we came far enough to come into Russia. And they sent us to a, a village. And it was too cold. We had no clothes. So we asked my parents asked for permission to let us go to Tashkent. I don't know if any, it's in Uzbekistan. And they let us go, except they didn't have room for us. They were packed, so they sent us to a, a little um, village. Uh, and in that village, they were growing cotton. And there was nothing to eat. They gave us a barn where they took out the animals, because they had no place for us. They themselves didn't have room. And there were two beds made out of straw for the men and the women. Anyway, my mother, I forgot to tell you, my mother was pregnant when we left home. So by the time all this time moves on, that was in June, now it's close for her to give birth. And, um, and when she gave, and by then everybody got sick with, with um, Malaria with, with, with typhoid, typhus, 
typhus. Yeah, right. typhus. And um, it was just awful. There was nothing to eat, and they didn't grow any food. They grew cotton. Can you eat cotton? And um, everybody was swollen, and it was just the worst time besides the bombing. We didn't suffer as much hunger on the bomb, on the wagon. We were afraid of our lives. But here, we had nothing to eat. And this one time, so my mother gives birth and doesn't know that she's giving birth. And my father cuts the umbilical cord, and they wrap it around, and they take her, oh, take her to a hospital. And um, and while she was there, they brought other members from my from the family because they got typhus, and they brought it there. But the hospital didn't have any medication for anybody. None of us. You guys are going to be doctors, right? So tell me, how do you survive with so many people in the little barn? having, like I said, malaria, dysentery, typhus, without an aspirin, just laying and suffering. And we did it. We survived. I don't know how. I'm here to tell the story. Unfortunately, I'm the only one left to do it. And um, I will have my grandson tell you a story what happened to my mother after we came out of this hell and she brought something with her that we didn't know so he's gonna tell you so like she said I'm just gonna read a short excerpt I this is one of the most powerful stories for me in in the book, um, and I like it because it's a little bit more medically related. Um, so as she said, uh, this is after they left Uzbekistan, they, they said enough is enough, we can't deal with the starvation and sickness, and let's go back. Where'd you go after you were there? We went back to where we were originally, in the, in the Urals. Urals. Yeah, in the mountains in, in Russia. Um, and so they're in another displaced persons camp there, and this is where the story takes place. Um, my great-grandmother at the time was very sick, cachectic, in a, in a hospital, and that's where the, the story starts. Um, so Azriel carried, and this is in her perspective, Azriel carried me out of the hospital in his arms. My dry lips cracked open. Sally saw a watermelon on the side of the road. She picked it up, broke it on a rock, and squeezed juice Ju ju squeezed a juicy piece over my open mouth. When we reached home, my throat was on fire. Tanya kissed my cheek and ran outside. We heard dogs barking viciously, and my heart froze as I knew how much Tanya feared dogs. I watched the door, waiting for Tobola to, enter, to return in fear, but it took 15 minutes before she returned, holding a large watermelon in both arms, barely maintaining her balance under the heavy weight. Her face was white as linen. My little angel walked through a field full of wicked dogs to bring her mama relief. Azriel squeezed watermelon juice over my mouth. I swallowed it with difficulty and nodded to indicate that I wanted more. Azriel grabbed a tin cup and squeezed more juice in for me. I drank from the tin cup, but when I finished drinking, a terrible bitterness spread in my mouth. I looked into the tin cup and realized that Azriel had given me juice from a cup we used to hold kerosene for our lamps. I had just drank poison. There it was, a fitting conclusion to Satan bo Satan's bombs, the gushing rivers, the fatal disease, the hunger, the heartbreak, and my, baby's, my, the, my dead baby girl. God had to find a new method to draw fresh pleasure from my demise. For all things, of all things, poison. How clever was the master of the universe? The fire in my stomach traveled down to my lower abdomen. Inside me, I felt movement, as if my intestines began to spin, burned by the poison. Then the bottom of my body 
was pinched cruelly. I jerked and I laid on my side, moaning with fear and pain. My stomach rose and sank in a mad dance. Again, my abdomen was pressed in a vice, followed by itching and scorching at my bottom. I had a terrible urge to relieve myself as if my guts were about to explode. I screamed and I let it go. Clara yelled at the men to leave. Sally and Clara gave, held me as I crouched. I saw the shock on their faces as they laid me on my back, half sitting against the wall. I could see it on the floor in front of me. A six foot long tapeworm, as thick as my thumb, twitching and rattling, shining and moist. I could not believe this revolting parasite could be God's messenger of death, residing inside of me, eating away at my guts with such ferocious hatred. Azrael took me back to the hospital and showed them the tapeworm. They kept me in the hospital a few weeks for recovery. Sally came every day with a pot of soup. Slowly, I regained enough strength to return home. So we came back from, from Uzbekistan and um, Azriel was drafted and my father was drafted to the army. Morris couldn't go because he had a bad food, the other were too young. And they send him away for a couple of weeks for training. And then they send, and my father to Chikalov, which was the main city near us in the Urals. And he lived with the people in a the, in the factory or whatever. I used to come home every now and then. Azrael was taken and sent away, and when he was done with it, they gave him a three-day leave, and then he had to go to report to the army. So when he came home, my father wasn't there. As real and Sally, he talked her into getting married, and they went and they signed up and they got married. They came home and told my mother that they are married. So my mother said, "If you're married, may as well have a Jewish uh, chuppah." You know what that is, right? A Jewish wedding. So I remember laying, so near us lived a Jewish man that knew that uh, stuff, the prayers and everything, and my mother asked him, but I remember laying like on a bed low and looking up, and they were holding a white towel or something, like a chuppah, and they got married in Jewish. Tomorrow, he's ready to go back. He's on the train, and the train breaks down, and he has to be at a certain day by the army. And the, uh, the uh, police came uh, looking at your papers, and they see that he's a day late. And he gets five years in jail in the gulags. And then uh, my sister found out that, they, that he's in jail. She uh, I mean, it was terrible. But after staying there for a while, they used to write letters. And um, my mother decided with my father that we should pick up, ask for permission, because he can't go from one town to another without a permission. And they gave us a permission to move to Chikalov, to the head of uh, Urals. And so my father used to come home every weekend, and Sally, and so my mother learned how to do donuts, and uh, went to the market, black market, which you're not allowed to sell, but she went to sell to have us eat a little bit. Sally did the same thing, but she sent everything to Israel, to jail. And she didn't get any letters from him, we didn't know why at the time, so everybody said, we told you, he must have found somebody, you know, and make a life miserable, miserable. And um, me, they put in a home for 18 months. It was like a vacation, like a, um, um, like a kid. The government was doing this for people that were heroes. And in Russia, if you had a lot of kids, 
the woman was a hero. So my mother had the document and all. She got it all back at home when the Russians came in. But anyway, so she was able to get me in for two months. She can only be there two months. But the, the principal was a Jewish woman, Sophia, and my mother used to come at night and do stuff for her to work. So I stayed there till the, the end of the war. I remember when the war ended, they woke us all up and we looked outside for the, um, what do you call it, the, on July, we do fireworks. And it was really very nice. So Azriel, it's two years that Azriel is in jail. And um, Sally doesn't hear from him. And again, everybody, he has somebody there. Blah, blah, blah. And the poor thing, she was so unhappy, and she was alone, stayed away from us. And whatever she made, she kept for him. She kept sending him packages, even though she didn't get letters. At the end of the, in two years, the war ended, so they let all the uh, um, prisoners out, prisoners of war. And they let him out, and we didn't hear from him. And one day, my sister Clara and Sally, and another man who later married my sister Clara, who had a crush on Sally, it's a whole story. And, <laughs> and uh, so they went someplace, they had to pass a fence, that the, the market was fenced in, somebody made a big hole, people used to go through a shortcut, and they're waiting to go through, and this um, beggar with torn clothes, it's not shaven, the, 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 is going through, and they're waiting on the side, and when he stands up, it's just real. So it was great. They let him out of the army, and he knew where we were, because he got her letters, but she couldn't get his, because we moved. So at the end of the war, she got a whole pack with the letters. One day, a friend came in to us who was born in our hometown. And later we lived together where I live now for all the years. And my daughter's named after their mother. We were very close. So he was in Chikalov working for the hospital delivering stuff. So he was able to drop off a little piece of wood, you know, like steel. So uh, one day he came to our house. I wasn't there because I was away, but I heard so many times. And he came with a letter from his sister. It was right after the war. And our part was where the Nazis came in first. No, where the Russians came in first uh, to uh, liberate the people because we were closer to the border from the Russians than when they came. Um, so when they were liber when his sister and family was, another sister, they, when they were liberated, she looked up, everybody was looking how to find their families, and she found them, and she wrote them a letter telling him what happened in our hometown to everybody, including our family. And my parents read it and realized how lucky we were that we did leave and that if it wouldn't be for Sally, we wouldn't have survived. They got dressed and they went because she lived with her husband in a different room in the same building. And they went to apologize and he just became a son. It was, there was no difference. And he always loved my parents, and they understood what they think, that she ran away and, uh, you know, to follow him, and because of that we had to leave and the kids are suffering. She heard it every day. So um, at the end when we gave out the books, everybody in the family had something, you know, said something. And she said, she said, I knew. I, 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 I knew I was blamed, and they were right to blame me. It was because of me, but it was worth it to, to 
take all the blame and to see my family saved. That's it. of SUNY Downstate and the Student Center Governing Board. This is just a, a little bit of show of gratitude. Oh my God. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Any questions? No? Okay. Uh, so I just want to tell you that last night I couldn't fall asleep. What I'm going to talk to the faculty, my English, my accent. I felt like, how am I going to do? How do you think I did? did Yay! Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And I hope that each one of you that is in school and has an idea for what they want in their future, that it all comes through for you.